Okay, uh, thank you everyone for joining today. My name is Ellen Blackburn. Um, I'm a core team consultant at the Information Lab. And in this session, we're gonna be talking about data literacy. Um, so I'll get started by sharing my screen um, now that we've given people a few minutes to join. Okay. Um, so just a quick shout out before we start, um, all of the materials being used today were created by my colleague, Sam Shermer. Uh, so thank you for him for putting these together. Uh, and also just a quick note on before we get started is that uh, in terms of questions, you're welcome to throw those in the chat throughout the session and we'll leave it. So there's a few minutes at the end of the session today for us to have a look at questions, but um, kind of won't be going through them uh, as we go through the session. Otherwise I'll kind of lose my train of thought inevitably. Um, so yeah, any questions that you have, feel free to show them, throw them in the chat. Um, so the data literacy talk that we're going to be going through today is uh, broadly sp split into three different parts. Uh, the first is going to look at data literacy as more of a concept and how we use data. Uh, part two will look at more of the fundamentals to do with data visualization. And for part three, we will start thinking about uh, sort of the things that we need to consider and keep in mind as we start to build our visualizations. So off the bat with part one, why do I need to know about data literacy? Data is everywhere. Uh, both inside and outside the workplace. Uh, and in the, if we start thinking about the workplace more specifically, as we know, businesses are making conscious shifts to become more data-driven organizations. And because of this, data literacy is an increasingly important skill going forward. We've Gartner recently saying that data literacy is an essential part of data-driven culture. There are also additional benefits to current roles and businesses that can be made when we start thinking about data literacy. It's important to note that data literacy is not just for data scientists and analysts. Uh, employees that have expertise over a given business area are going to be the ones that are best able to contextualize and act upon data insights and create results going forward. And this is why it's critical for everyone in your organization, not just the data analysts, but also people say in a say managerial position as well to be data literate. And lastly, many of us are using data every day already. And given this, it makes sense to make sure that you're using data in a way that's most effective and efficacious and fine tune what you're doing already. So I've kind of spoken about why data literacy is important, um, but now we can have uh, a bit more of a discussion about what data literacy is in a more sort of general sense. So we've got a few quotes here to help explain this. The first one is from John Morrow, who's the global head of data literacy at Click. Uh, he describes data literacy as the ability to read, work with, analyze, and argue with data. And the emphasis here is on analyze and argue with. Data literacy is about empowering users to have the ability to not only read data, but ask questions, gain knowledge, and use data in a way that provides evidence to turn our claims into compelling arguments which we can then use in turn to communicate meaning and value to others. And the second quote that we have here is from Forbes. Uh, to the uninitiated, reading text is just as hard as reading data or graphs. Um, so simply put, like we saw in the previous quote, data literacy is the ability to read, understand and communicate with data. Uh, however, some people argue that this isn't like reading text because it requires some sort of math skill or some coveted knowledge to understand it, implying there's a sort of a greater degree of complexity to interpret a chart rather than a passage of written text. Um, however, Forbes argues that for the uninitiated, and by un uninitiated we mean those who don't have special knowledge or experience, reading text is just as hard as reading data or charts. But what some of us are missing are the skills to question assumptions, ask the right questions, and use data to underpin our decisions. And uh, sort of achieving data literacy is, is, uh, can help us with that. And kind of more about, um, you know, why learn data literacy? You may be thinking, uh, if you already work with data, why do you need to learn more? Uh, and this is because when we work with data, there are several things that can often go wrong. So these are all commonplace issues that can trip us up on our day to day when we're working with data. Um, and these are duplication, misinterpretation, 
uh, incorrect data types and security breaches. And a few of these we'll be looking at in some more data, um, some more detail going on. And having a greater sense of data literacy and in turn empowering users to ask better questions of their data can help us spot these potential pitfalls earlier on and uh, as a result circumvent the issues associated. So it's another reason why data literacy is a uh, sort of important in a data setting. And having a better awareness of these issues can result in better results, which brings us on to this section that we have here on the right. So there's less chance of making mistakes, which is kind of what I've touched on, and that understanding data means there'll be less chance of incorrect interpretation, and, you know, can kind of get us on the best foot for avoiding these mistakes. There's also um, better outcomes. And what we mean by better outcomes, this is referring to realizing the power of data-driven decision-making. Firms that invested heavily in data skills have seen sharper rises in fortunes that those that ha haven't. And because of these results, we've seen large market shifts. This is a bit of an outdated stat here, but uh, Gartner expected 80% of firms to have rolled out data literacy by 2020, with more, uh, with more to come in 2021. So, you know, it clearly pays to, to be in the know when it comes to uh, data literacy. So we've kind of addressed data literacy, uh, why we need to know it and what it means. Um, so now we can start thinking about data um, in a little more detail. And starting off, we're going to have a look at what is a data source. Um, we touched on how data is everywhere. And obviously, all this data stems from various different sources. And you likely use many of these different sources in your day to day. Uh, we have a few examples on this slide. So starting off, we have um, databases. These are organized data sources which are created for uh, storing and uh, accessing of data. And these include things like Microsoft SQL and Salesforce. We also often work with flat files. Uh, these are where uh, data is stored in a textual manner and includes things like CSVs and Excels. And there's also a multitude of other sources that we may find ourselves using. Um, these can include metrics from social media, data from emails, or frequently the use of APIs. And when we're used to working and we, you know, we need to be ready, readily available to work with a wide variety of data sources, and no matter what type of data source we're working with, it's important that we keep uh, the question in mind of whether or not these data sources are of good quality. So whatever company you're working with, they normally have at least, you know, some data which is of pretty poor quality and so it's very important for us to have an awareness of these issues to take them into consideration when we're making data-driven decisions and for that it's helpful to understand what exactly makes a good data source so we have a few various different attributes here including um, completeness accuracy consistency and uniqueness so when we're thinking about completeness, you know, we want to make sure that obviously a partial month or say a missing country isn't playing down our current figures. And when we think about accuracy, it's important that we know where our data is coming from, how often it's updated, you know, how many decimal places are being used and an awareness of potential rounding errors, for example. Regarding consistency, we want to make sure all of our records are the same. Um, so this may be an issue which happens when you work with a lot of country data. There may be different country names between, you know, the various different data sources you're using. One may include USA and then the other may refer to it as United States. And this incongruence may result in some issues when you're bringing your data sources together. And if we kind of take the country example a little further, you need to make sure that our data is using the same currency and using the correct exchange rate throughout to ensure consistency across our data. And lastly, uniqueness, we need to make sure there are no duplicates in our data, which could be potentially skewing our figures. And whatever data source you're using, if it adheres to all of these, then it's likely of good quality. Uh, and if it's not, you need to keep that kind of thing in mind when you're creating visualizations and uh, gleaning insights from them. So we thought about data sources um, and their quality, and now we can move on to thinking about a variety of data types and this because when we're thinking about data literacy it's important for us to know the type of data that we're dealing with and the reason it's important to know is because we need our computers to understand how to treat our data so for example if your date is coming through as a string 
Tableau won't understand how to display your dates and the order in which they come in. And similarly, if you're using numerical fields and they come in as a string with comma separators, Tableau or whatever BI software you're using wouldn't know it can perform numerical actions upon these values. So there's a kind of data types that you'll um, often come across and we'll look at these in some more detail on the next slide. So if we look at this slide here, um, these are the various different data types that you'll um, find yourself using. All of the blue, three blue tiles that we have at the top are numerical. Uh, and in this, we have new uh, integers, floats, and doubles. Integers are whole numbers with no decimals. A float is a number that goes up to seven decimal places, and a double is one up to 15 decimal places, 15 digits rather. Uh, next up, we have strings, and strings are uh, quite self explanatory are simply a sequence of characters like a customer name or a street name. A boolean is um, a condition that results in a true or false value, and uh, a date or a date time field is, uh, again, quite self explanatory And again, it's important to have awareness of these basic types and is a necessary element of data literacy to help ensure that we know the data type that we need and make sure that our data choices make sense. So if you go back to sort of that double and float example, um, if the, the storage for up to 15 digits, if we're employing a, a double data type will be much greater than that of a float, which is you know, up to only seven digits. So if you only need two decimal places and a few digits, it's good practice to only use what you need and require when you're thinking about things like this. Um, and then kind of an important one coming up next, um, we're gonna move on to data structure. And specifically, we're gonna be focusing on flat files versus databases and the differences between the two. Um, and these are important to focus on as this the, the impact of the differences between sort of classic spreadsheets and databases are ones that frequently come up when we start working with data, particularly when we start integrating in BI software. So the crux of these differences are that spreadsheets are often driven by being aimed to the increased legibility for the human eye. So whilst it's much easier for an employee to read an Excel like we have here on the left, it can result in a lot of issues for the software that's trying to read it. And conversely, databases are structured with BI software in mind and are optimized for this. And accordingly, the resulting sort of um, data structure is much less digestible to the human eye. And we can see this with the examples below. So if we start on the left, uh, we have our nicely, for, um, we have our classic spreadsheet, um, and there's sort of the key attributes that we have underneath. And that classic spreadsheets often include a title like we have at the top here. A title which has merged cells like this will result in nulls when we start bringing that into Tableau, and it'll kind of be a right faff when we start um, doing our sort of data manipulation. Uh, they also often include things like unnecessary totals columns. These aren't needed, again, because they're very easily calculated in whatever BI software that you're using. We also have our years across the top, which results in uh, a data source of quite a wide structure. And if we have those years across the top, that would be um, that wouldn't be particularly easy for Tableau to visualize. That definitely wouldn't be ideal. And additionally, on the kind of merge shells, um, similar vein, they off, um, these classic spreadsheets often include breaks and multiple tables. And again, that will cause a lot of nulls and make it very difficult for Tableau to read. And um, yeah, you get results are saying it's very easy to read for the user. Um, it's, you know, it's quite clear to go across, but it's very difficult for a computer to read. In the middle, we have a nicely formatted spread spreadsheets. This kind of works as a nice middle ground between our classic spreadsheet and our database. In this, it looks a little bit different. We have our measures as our headers. So we have our you know, sales, profit, and orders across the top and our years down the side. Um, so we have a row as a year. And we've also got no titles. And because we've kind of done this pivot, it means the structure of this data source is taller. Um, and again, like I mentioned, this is a good midpoint as it's fairly easy to read for the user and it's fairly easy to read for the computer. And then on the right here, we have our database, um, which is quite a lot different to our classic spreadsheet. Um, here, our headers explain our values. We have a row per data points and we have measures and values uh, at the top instead of having our sort of sales, profit and orders and so on. And this results in an even taller and thinner structure. The benefits of this is this becomes quite flexible from a sort of 
data structure standpoint. As it becomes more dynamic, it's easier to adapt and add in columns and perform calculations. But the, the result is something that's hard to read for the user. Um, you know, if you just had um, a user trying to look at this and kind of gain an insight into uh, uh, kind of a few little trends, it's going to be quite difficult, but this would be very easy to read for a computer. And if we're thinking in terms of Tableau and other BI software, we're definitely going to want to be working with the with the latter two, and preferably something that looks like our database. Um, so the primary thing that we want to do with our data is analysis. And in doing so, we need to make sure that we're kind of making appropriate considerations about the aggregation and distribution of our data. So first, if we're thinking about aggregations, these the way, this is the way in which our data is gathered and collated and expressed in a summary form. And there are many different types of aggregation that exist and thus many different ways that you can group your data, uh, which can all have an impact on the accuracy and the ultimate conclusions that we draw from our data sets. Data distributions, however, differ a little bit. These are functions which concern how frequently values appear and how these are distributed within our data set. So this allows the user to grasp a basic idea of the data's shape and its pattern, and in turn can affect the possible calculations and aggregations that we use. So for example, understanding your data distribu distribution may illuminate to us that a median over a mean is far more appropriate. Um, when we're thinking about the data set that we're looking at. So for example, if we're looking at a, a data set of housing prices, if we had a look at the data distribution and we can see that there's a few major outliers, it can kind of illustrate to us that maybe we should be looking at median average, uh, median house price rather than mean house price and so on. And we have some examples here of the, the various different aggregations and data distributions. They overlap a little bit. Our aggregations include you know, the obvious things like sum and count and count distinct, but uh, our mean and our median are shared between our distribution and our aggregation, with data distribution also including things like frequency and quartiles. So that kind of um, was part one with the aim to focus on uh, what data literacy is, why do we need to learn it, and kind of starting to think about the data that we're using. And now we're moving on to part two, which is going to focus more on how we start thinking about data visualization and the elements of data literacy that are included in this sort of next element. So off the bat, um, what is data visualization? It's a method that dates back hundreds of years, and there are many, many studies that demonstrate that humans are better able to distinguish between pre-attentive attributes than looking at numbers or text. And data visualization allows for new insights as it's really easy to read, and it also allows quicker and deeper understanding of data. This is ultimately because data visualization gives us a clearer idea of what the data is actually telling us. And this is through giving us information in a visual context, which is more natural for the human eye and mind to comprehend. And, you know, it makes it easier just to gain that understanding and see patterns more clearly. And there are several ways in particular that data viz can increase our understanding. And these are kind of the elements of why we should visualize our data. So first up, we have trends. For example, it's much easier for us to see how data points are distributed over time and how they change month on month if we start to see things visually rather than in a table. Outliers, again, if we were to look at our data points in a scatter plot over something like a table, those values that are outside the norm and that you know, kind of deviate from the, from the general shape of our data would be much more readily visible in a visual format. And patterns similarly to trends, Visualization would mean that patterns and movements in our data are much more easily discovered. And in terms of relationships, it's much easier to spot relationships, co-relationships and co-dependence when we're seeing our data more visually. And just a quick note, which leads us on to sort of the next uh, little bit that we're going to be looking at is um, the summary statistics can be really useful, sort of those overall big numbers, but they don't always give us all the answers. So we need to make sure that we visualize our data appropriately, you know, have a good understanding of it and the having and playing with varying levels of granularity is key in doing that. And we can see that on the next slide. 
so for the next little bit, we're going to talk about Anscombe's Quartet. And um, so if I bring up these four charts that we have on the left, uh, I think we can all agree that they look very different. So the first chart that we have here in the top left looks to have a nice, sim uh, simple linear relationship. And then if we look at the one in the top right rather than the top left, um, it's not distributed normally. There's kind of a clear relationship between the two variables, but it's not linear like the first one. And if we look at our third example on the bottom left, again, this one's looking pretty linear. However, we can see that the trend line is being really offset by one very clear outlier that we have over here. And then the fourth one is sort of an exaggeration of this. We have a close cluster of points that don't really seem to indicate much of a relationship between our X and Y. Uh, and then again, we have a very clear outlier, kind of more of an outlier than the other one that seems to be throwing off our trend line. So all in all, it looks as though these charts are telling us very different stories. Um, however, when we dive into the summary statistics of these charts, and by the summary statistics, I mean our mean, our variance of our X and Y, our correlation and our linear regression. These four charts show nearly identical values across the board, despite looking very different when graphed. And the aim of this quartet is to show us the importance of looking at a data set graphically, you know, really playing around with it before we start our analysis. And in turn, this will allow us to know what analysis is appropriate. And if our takeaways at a summary level are, is, are particularly meaningful, and this kind of thing and this kind of concept is something to really keep in mind uh, when you're visualizing your data and you're getting familiar with a new data set. So next up, we're going to kind of start thinking a little bit more about creating data visualizations and what exactly constitutes as one. So uh, this is a quick example of how data visualization can bring about quicker and better insights if we look at the images below. First up, we have this picture here on the left. And if I were to ask you to pick out and count all the number nines that you saw in this image, you know, I think we can agree that it'd probably take you quite a long time. And additionally, once you've picked them out, if you want to go back and do a recount, you kind of have to find them all over again. You wouldn't exactly be able to remember where they all were. Um, however, if we were to show you this image instead, the answer and the, you know, the number of nines is much easier to glean in this image. And this is because we're using color to make them much readily, much more readily identifiable. And even this can be an example of data visualization. This is because the, the, the crux of visual analysis is to leverage pre-attentive attributes to make information as quickly and easy to process as possible. And the use of color here has made scouring the table much quicker and much easy for us to process. So I've mentioned the pre-attentive attributes a few times. Um, but we haven't gone into these in too much detail or elaborated too much so far. Um, so we can dig into what these are in a little more detail now. So Tableau um, explains that there are 10 or so different types of these. Um, and we have these illustrated in this left hand image that I have here. And we can also broadly split these into four different groups, which vary from most to least important. So in the four different groups that we have, we have our pre-attentive attributes on the left split into four groups. We've got position, which encompasses width, enclosure, length, orientation, and position. Then we have color, which includes both color hue and color intensity. And you can see how these two sort of differ on the image that we have here. Um, following this, we have size and shape, which are you know, quite self-explanatory, but we will look at these in a little more detail. And on the, on the right hand side here, I mentioned that we have this sort of scale from most important to least important. And what we mean by this is that the most important pre-attentive attribute is the one that we noticed first, and it's easiest to protest, process and interpret. So position would be um, something that our brain would see immediately, and shape would be the one that we sort of process last if we're dealing with a whole group of um, pre-attentive attributes. So it's something to keep in mind. We're going to look at these in a little more detail now, and we're going to start off with position. So position is all to do with mark location and how this relates to other marks. So a given data point could be longer, wider in a different location or orientated in a different way to other marks. 
And like I mentioned, position is the most important and effective of the pre-attentive attributes. This will be the first one that your brain notices when you engage in a data visualization. And we have a few examples of this below. So here we have length, position and grouping. We have length shown with the bar chart that we have here. Um, then we have position in the form of our scatter plot and grouping in the form of a scatter plot also. And that kind of makes sense as to why bar charts are so popular is because it's so easy to perceive the pre-attentive attribute of position when we're looking at the you know, specific attribute of length. Next up, we have the um, pre-attentive attribute of color. So color can be split into two different types, which we saw earlier, which are color hue and color intensity. And this is the second most important of the pre-attentive attributes. And so it's very, again, it's very commonly used. Uh, as color is a, you know, an instantly recognizable change and it quickly draws our eye to the variation in color and hue. And again, we have a couple of examples below. Well, we have color intensity on the left with the sort of um, the gradient of yellow to blue that we have on that chart. And then we have color hue on the right where we can see that our, uh, our eyes immediately drawn to that red bar compared to the other gray bars. Next up, we have size. So size is exactly how it sounds. This is the difference in overall size between marks and we can differentiate between length and width, which is a sort of a form of position. Uh, size instead looks across area, so it's comparable across different shapes. And again, we have a few different examples that we have here. We have a bubble chart or scatter plot on the left, which uses size to um, encode an additional metric on this really quite busy scatter plot. And then we have an example in this um, tree map on the right hand side. And tree, map, tree maps um, employ shape to allow the user to see parts of a whole. So here, the size is being used to bring attention to the value or share within both each of the squares themselves and the sort of wider square that they're situated in. And lastly, we have shape. And like I said before, shape is the least noticeable. It's the last one that we're gonna kind of acknowledge and process when we're, when we're looking at a visualization. Um, however, it can be used in a way that's helpful, but this is often uh, in conjunction with other attributes like we see here in this example. So for here, we've used both color to sort of indicate whether an arrow is going up or down um, in terms of profit. Uh, but we've also used the, the sort of shape or orientation of the triangle to in, in, uh, indicate this also. If we removed the, the shape of the, of the triangle from this, you know, it'd still be very easy, easy to see who was going up and who was going down in terms of, um, in terms of the color, because you know, it's quite um, readily, easily processed uh, by the eye. But if we were to just maintain the shape and remove the color, it'd be quite you know, difficult for us to immediately see who was up and who was down, which is why um, shape isn't used as readily as the other pre-attentive attributes. Um, and as you can see, these attributes have various levels of success and they're noticed in a specific order by the sort of the eye and the brain. So that's something to really keep in mind when you're communicating with your target audience. Um, you know, the, if you've got several metrics that you want to encode in a given visualization, then you should use the most important metric, should be using the most important and you know, most easily noted pre-attentive attribute and then work your way down. So again, that's um, something to put important keeping in mind um, and something that just makes things easier to communicate when you have a better sense of what your audience are looking for and a better understanding of data literacy. So next up, we're going to have a quick look at exploratory versus explanatory. This is kind of the final thing that we're going to be discussing in this section before we um, move on to part three. And again, it's a really important thing to keep in mind when you're building visualizations. So here we've got a couple of charts um, and a crucial element of, you know, whenever you're creating charts is that they're fit for purpose. And in turn, it's understanding how they will be used by the audience. So, for example, if we were creating a chart for a user and the aim was for them to take that away, explore it and garner their own insight. Or alternatively, the aim may be for us to highlight and convey several key points and ideas to our user. And those two different aims you know, result in two different approaches to data visualization. And we can see this in the two examples below. So the example on the left 
um, we're simply just showing the user the information. We have top 10 states by sales using Superstore. And you know, the user can potentially just take this way, explore, you know, they can glean what they want to about the, the order of the states here and the, and the differences between them. However, in the example on the right, we have the exact same information. But instead of leaving the user to come up with their own conclusions, we've guided the user and conveyed our, our own conclusions through color coding and a descriptive title. So if the title is a bit trickier, tricky for you to see, essentially it says that of the top four states by sales, three of those states are, for, are the geographically largest states in the US, which have been, uh, accordingly, they've been highlighted in red. And the fourth state is much smaller, which is Washington. And the title tells the user this is perhaps something that should be investigated as to why, you know, the three geographically larger states appear in the top three, but then a state which is much, much smaller is appearing in there also. So it's kind of an example of how um, this, you know, it's an important distinction when you're building things and it's key if you decide which is most uh, appropriate for the audience that you're catering for. Should it be something that they can explore in their own time and come up with their own things? Or are you looking to convey specific arguments and conclusions to your target audience? Um, so with that, we're gonna move on to part three. And part three continues to focus on visualization, um, but it kind of notes some more important things to keep in mind when we start building things out. So for the first one, different situations, different visualizations. And an important part of data literacy is thinking about which data visualization best fits the requirements at hand. For example, if you're looking at um, some data where you want to visualize it over time, uh, a pie chart or a tree map wouldn't be a good way to do this, as these are charts which aim to visualize data as parts of a whole, and they wouldn't be able to effectively show a trend over time. And if we start thinking about combinations of different pre-attentive attributes, these multiple ones can exist within each chart type. So again, if we think about a pie chart, that's a combination of color and size that we're using. And we want to think about, you know, where, do we want to use a combination of pre-attentive attributes or is that kind of working in a way that overwhelms the viewer? Is it easier or better to focus on one than the other? Do, you know, do we really need both? And lastly, simplicity is often king. Uh, sometimes we can get a little bit bored with the types of charts that we're, that we're building and creating in our day to day. Um, but the reason that we're always building the same charts is that more often than not, bars and line charts will always get the job done. And, you know, they're often easier to read than their counterparts, as we'll see later on. So it's important to not kind of get caught up in um, what may look better or trying to make things look additionally fancy when, in fact, you're just making conclusions harder to harder to ascertain from the, the visualizations that you're building. We kind of have a nice summary there from um, Andy Kreeble and Eva Murray, who run Maker of a Monday. Uh, who say that understanding the purpose of different chart types will help you communicate information more effectively. Um, so why certain chart types? Uh, we had this example up in the previous section where we know that our number nines are far easier to spot on the right than they are on the left. And this is because the process is greatly expedited by the use of color. Uh, it brings what we're searching for into the foreground and makes our eyes and brain process it much faster. Um, but we can look at another visualization uh, example to you know, get this to hit home a little bit more. So with this example that we're gonna be doing here with this little table, um, I appreciate it's quite hard to see, um, but let's pretend our aim is to see which product is the most and least profitable. With, prod, uh, with image one, if you were to look at this, you know, it'd likely take you a very long time to find the answer. And, you know, maybe you wouldn't be sure that that answer was correct. It'd be hard for you to, you know, be pretty adamant that you hadn't missed a larger or smaller value as your eyes scanned the table. But if we added in a pre-attentive pre attribute of color, like we did in our prior example, now we can immediately see which products are profitable and which are unprofitable. So this makes our task of finding sort of, you know, the, um, the most and least profitable items slightly easier, as we know that we need to search all of the red numbers to find our least profitable, and we need to search all the black ones to find the most profitable. However, you know, it's quite clear, it's still really tricky to glean a sense of scale by just looking at the text. So now we have our final picture, and this makes the answer a lot clearer. So alongside the color, we've now add, uh, added the pre-attentive attribute of position. 
and the introduction of position has given our brain some new information that we can much more quickly perceive. And now when looking at this, you know, it's much more clear that um, copiers and phones are in this particular example anyway, are kind of leading the way in terms of profit. And tables here is our least profitable uh, across the board for our various different segments. So um, we started thinking about how we can apply chart types to make information easier. Um, so now let's have a little look at the main chart types you'll likely come across um, when you're visualizing data. So whenever you're looking at um, so whenever you're looking at data visualization, uh, the lion's share of them will be made up by these charts, and that's a very good reason. And you know, when you're creating visualizations, it's important to uh, know and try and understand which chart type is best for the job. So a few quick examples here. Um, obviously, we're starting off with bar charts. These are likely the most common charts you come across, and this is you know with good reason. It's because they're really simple, and again, because they're using that pre-attentive attribute of position, they're incredibly easy to read. And you know, probably generally always going to be one of the best chart types for the job. Then we have tables below this. Um, tables can get quite a lot of stick in data visualization, but they definitely do have their place. For example, if you just want to see your data very granularly and you want to have the exact value, a table is going to be very fit for purpose. Additionally, if you use something like a highlight table or a heat map, like the one that we have here in the blue and orange, you can add more life to your tables. And because we've added the use of color, we can also add some additional context for our users. And also heat maps and highlight tables like these are a really good place to start if you're trying to get your users used to seeing data more visually, if they're just used to, you know, plain old sort of black and white grid type tables. Next up, we have pie charts and donut charts. Um, again, like tables, you can, these can get quite a lot of stick when we're sort of talking about data visualization and chart types. And this is because their reliance on color, size, and also being parts of a whole means it can be really difficult to draw out exact values, um, which is something that we'll explore a little bit later on. Um, however, they can be good in certain situations. So, that, so this would be an example of how I would sort of employ a donut or a pie chart is in something where we've only got maybe two or tops three segments. And then it can be you know, quite good as a KPI value and easy to get a big overall number. Next, we have line charts, and obviously these are really handy when we're allowing users to easily understand patterns, trends, and shapes over time. Followed by scatter plots, which are all about shape relationships and outliers, which quickly allows users to um, sort of understand relationships between variables. And then lastly, we have maps. Maps are really easily understood and they're very intuitive chart type, but they're not always necessarily the best way to present your geographical data. For example, if your data is sort of broken down by state, like we were looking before in our various bar charts, but there's no actual geographic trend or distribution that you're wanting to look at, then a map isn't a way to go. If you're just interested in like the top 10 states by sales, just because it's a state, you don't have to use a map. A bar chart would fill that brief very nicely. However, there are many other chart types. That's definitely not an exhaustive list, um, but for a more expansive guide, I really recommend looking at Andy Creeble's visual vocabulary, uh, which is the Tableau version of something created by FT Graphics. Um, clicking on the link there will take you to Andy's profile and you're able to delve into any single one of these categories. Um, if I show an example here, see how quick Tableau Public has been today. So with this example, you could look at Andy's um, visual uh, vocabulary vocabulary, which again is based on FT graphics. And if you decide that you were intrigued in looking at some um, chart types to do with deviation, you could click on that and then you'd be sort of taken to, to uh, various different chart types. So that's really handy if you're yeah, looking for some additional inspiration for other chart types. Okay, um, so sort of the last kind of section that we have for part three is this uh, consideration section, which includes things that we should always try and keep in mind when we're creating our dashboards. And first up, we're going to be looking at proportions. So proportions are really important as they can very easily mislead the user. If you're using cutoffs and truncated axes, you can create an unfair image of the proportionality of change. And in the below example, you can see that with a uh, 
with Spanish GDP from 2005 to 2012. So in picture A, um, the one on the left, the axis doesn't start at zero. And accordingly, this makes it like there's been some very large fluctuations between 2005 and 2012, um, particularly between say that, um, that first year and this mid year that we had here, it looks like there's been a very large jump. However, when we start our axis at zero, like we do in picture B, you can see that the GDP has been far more stable and the changes look much less significant. So make sure that you're not misleading your audience and you're only using these techniques where appropriate. Um, and what we mean by that is, you know, you're only using an axis that st uh, doesn't start at zero when it really makes sense. When you're only looking at incredibly sort of incremental changes between very similar data, then it's appropriate. But other than that, you know, you may find yourself misleading your audience in the kind of thing that you're visualizing. And uh, next up, I said that we'll kind of look at uh, pie charts in a little more detail, and that's what we're looking at here. So this one uh, is kind of looking at pie segments. And again, touched on it earlier. If we take this example below with the pie chart on the left, um, it'd be nearly impossible to tell the difference between our blue and green portions that we see there on the left hand side. But when we take this and we put it into a bar chart, it becomes immediately clear. And it'd still be pretty clear even if our bar chart wasn't you know, sorted in the way that it is. So again, you know, keep this thing in mind when you're selecting your chart type and the pre-attentive attributes that you're employing. Um, because the uh, pie chart is using size, it's, you know, it's using area and parts of a whole, it is kind of much more difficult to perceive than position, which is what our, what our bar chart is employing. So again, a couple of sections in a pie chart can be quite easy to interpret, but as soon as we start getting a few that are of quite similar values and we aren't including very clear labels, you know, it becomes quite difficult to understand, um, you know, give a sense of who's the largest and who's the smallest. And for the last consideration that we're going to be thinking about, we're going to quickly talk about accessibility. Um, and this is because we should aim for our dashboards to be as legible to as many different users as possible. And uh, yeah, it's kind of an important part of data literacy that may not be as frequently touched on. Um, so starting off with color blindness, this is one that you know kind of everyone is aware of. Uh, color blindness is obviously extremely common, affecting around one in twelve men and around one in two hundred women. Color blindness comes in many different forms, but red green color blindness is the most common, and this is one that you know becomes quite pertinent in data visualization, as red and green are very often our natural positive and negative focus. You know we're kind of very used to red meaning bad and green meaning good. So going forward in your data visualization and what you're creating, think about what are the colors that you could use to convey this message that would make it much easier for your colorblind users. There's a reason that most BI tools default to orange and blue, for example. And if you're desperate to use red and green, there are some more friendly options aside from this. Um, so if you were, to, for example, to use a cool blue toned green and a very sort of warm orange toned red, it would make that still much easier for um, users to perceive in the general red and green that you often get in these kinds of things. Uh, next up, we have focus order, which I don't think is one that comes up particularly often, um, but is an important one nonetheless. Uh, dashboards are generally set up to be used with a mouse and keyboard, but there are many users who do not have that capability and instead use things like screen readers or a keyboard only. And whilst many programs are set up for this, the order of focus and the underlying setup of XML can make this difficult. So if you think about within Tableau, for example, using inbuilt titles and legends instead of text boxes allows most screen readers to more easily understand the dashboard. So, you know, the kind of the ease of use of using um, inbuilt titles and legends is something that you could keep in mind when you're building your dashboards um, to make it easier for those who uh, kind of use screen readers and things like that. And finally, contrast. Uh, so users with poor eyesight can struggle to make out dashboards with too little contrast, as colours that are non-contrasting are, you know, obviously much more difficult for the uh, users to read and the eye to perceive. Uh, to tackle this, the web content accessibility guidelines have their own specified sort of contrast recommendations when you're building things, which I suggest having a look into. And there's also quite a few handy websites where you can sort of pick your background colour, pick your text colour, uh, and then they'll sort of rank that on how accessible it is in various different text sizes. 
um, which are a really good way of sort of assessing your color combinations and know that you're making them easier for a wide range of users. Um, an additional point of um, contrast that we don't have on the slide here is when we're thinking about our dyslexic users. So um, alternatively, too much contrast, specifically black text on a white background can make legibility difficult for users that have dyslexia. Um, instead, employing a very dark text on a pastel background is much easier to read. So considering this is definitely like a, a good spot and a good midpoint between having enough contrast to help users with poor eyesight perceive what we're showing them, but not having so much contrast on like a bright white background to make it difficult for our dyslexic users. Um, so again, a lot of things to consider when we're creating our visualizations. Uh, so that was all the elements and that was the end of part three. So just going to do a quick wrap up now with some of the with some of the key points that um, hopefully you guys will take away from today's presentation is that data quality allow you, allows users to make consistent decisions. It makes errors less likely and it leads to quicker, smoother decision making. So make sure you're checking the quality of your data and, you know, help ensure that you're putting in place management across your organization to uh, ensure that data quality is you know, something that's really sort of valued and consistent across your data sources. Also remembering that data structure and types are really important for using data easily. Think about how your data will be used and therefore how the source should be structured, how it should be manipulated and what data types should be employed within your data sources. And again, um, remember that summary statistics do not equal all the answers. Make sure that when you get a data set, you're exploring the data enough to know that you're drawing accurate conclusions, especially when you start aggregating and summarizing things up to those big overall numbers. You know, make sure that they're on sound foundations by making sure that you visualize things at several layers of granularity and you really understand your data source. And for in terms of pre-attentive attributes, um, we've gone through those quite um, quite extensively, and they really bring your story to life. So make sure that you're using them simply and effectively throughout your data visualizations, and that you're really using them to convey things to your audience as um, as sort of clearly as possible. And remember that your chart choice matters. Uh, there are many chart choices out there, but they're not always the right choice. So try and make sure that you're doing what's um, best for you, what's best for the data, and is really illustrating what you're trying to show. And try and not get too caught up in, you know, using fancy chart types. Um, bar charts and line charts will probably always get you everywhere that you need to go. And lastly, uh, what we just touched upon, dashboard accessibility. Uh, the more people that can read your sort of data visualization and the, the things that you're creating, the more people will be able to draw insights and in turn, the more useful it shall be. So take into account accessibility options that will make it easier for others to consume the content that you're creating. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for um, joining today's session. Um, I can see that we have uh, a few questions in the, in the chat and the Q&A that we can look at. Um, right. Handley. Thanks, Ellen. That was no great. Yep, there's one question um, that I can see in the Q&A. So, um, are there any frameworks or ready-made evaluations to help assess an organisation's data literacy? Um, I don't know if we have any readily kind of made frameworks to um, help assess an organisation's data literacy. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think we do have anything kind of off the shelf. Um, I was having a little search, saw this question come in earlier, had a little search um, and asked around and there is uh, something that might be a little bit useful for you. Um, it's for Leah. I'll just drop it in the chat. Um, Tableau's blueprint as well, I think has a question on this, but um, it's kind of fairly top level. Um, but yeah, hopefully that helps. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? Got a lot of thank yous going on in the chat for you, Ellen. Lots of people appreciating the content. Good, good news. Um, we will give it one more minute, see if anyone else has any questions. No problem, Leah. You're welcome. Cool. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, we will leave it there. Thank you again, Ellen, for your time. Um, 
that was oh we someone snuck one in <laughs> where's that gone uh what about bias control and ethics on data feels like a fairly big question to me yeah, I don't really, I don't really know how to start with that one. I think we we did do a webinar recently on that kind of thing, didn't we? In terms of ethics and visualizing things ethically. Yes, I think we did. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can quickly find it. But otherwise, um, we did do a webinar on something similar to that recently, which will be on our YouTube channel. Um. Got another question, Power BI or Tableau? Different purpose. Um, so my interpretation of that question is, which should you be using or is there a different purpose between the two? Um, I, well, we're very biased, aren't we? In terms of we just <laughs> use Tableau for everything and we only uh, use Power BI when we're made to. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I'd say a lot of the stuff that you were talking about is relevant to both it's kind mm -hmm. of data literacy generally rather than tool specific so you could apply everything that ellen was talking about to both of those tools um but yeah the approaches to using both of those tools are, are um, different is uh, we talk a lot about the pros and cons of both power bi and tableau and why you might choose one over the other so um again a fairly big topic for for right now so if you are interested you can get in touch and we can go into more detail on that. Another one, Ellen, what's the best reason to use a heat map? Um, best reason to use a heat map? Uh, I think they're quite good when you want to use, look at something like profit, like we did in that example, where it kind of diverges um, from blue to orange to make things really pop out, or if you just um, try and look at sales or something over time, um, and you just Sometimes if it's you've got quite a lot of data and there's a lot of rows and um, a lot of columns, if you're using a bar chart like that, it can sometimes get a little bit messy when you've kind of got values on there as well. So if it's something that's kind of a bit too complex for a bar chart, but you still want to convey things nicely, I think a heat map um, is kind of a good use case for that. Uh, but you have to watch out for them a little bit because just because the way that they're structured, sometimes you can perceive one color to be sort of a darker or lighter, depending on the colors that surround it. So that's kind of a legibility thing that would make a bar chart a bit better, um, but that's something to just keep in mind when you use them. Great, thank you. 